like to acknowledge that we are here on the land of Gadigal people, on land that was never ceded. And um, I'm going to talk about Labor's trade policy. Um, first, just reminding ourselves what the Liberal previous government, Liberal National Government's trade policy was. Um, and it's very much in this tradition of neoliberal economic policy. So it's a sort of subset of a broader policy which is about basically about having very small government, low taxes and redistributing income downwards, <laughs> sorry, upwards, <laughs> um, taxing working people more and taxing business less. Um, but the trade aspect of it is um, having aiming towards zero tariffs or taxes on imports um, and all other what is perceived as barriers to trade and investment. And the idea that each country should specialise in its most competitive exports and import everything else at the lowest possible prices. And that you should have no active industry policies, no assistance to industry um, in addition to zero tariffs. And also minimum gov government regulation, not only of um, trade, but also of products and services. And what this does is maximise low-cost global production chains for corporations, but it um, intensifies competitive pressures on workers and communities and promotes a race to the bottom on labour rights and environmental standards. And we know the figures on global inequality have got worse, particularly over the last decade. That's not all down to unfair trade, but trade is supposed to lift people's living standards and contribute to greater um, equity. And um, we haven't seen clear evidence of that, although trade has expanded. So what we end up with is a lot of, especially in Australia, an over-dependence on imports with narrow manufacturing base and um, unable to produce, as we found during the pandemic, essential medical products, but also other products. Um, and also because of the deregulation of services and so on, uh, and the push to um, have foreign investment in services, um, scarce public health services to deal with the pandemic. So, um, the other thing about this whole trade scene is that the whole process is very secretive and undemocratic, um, even in parliamentary terms. So um, trade agreements are negotiated in secret, and we hear that they're going on, but we don't know what they're talking about, um, and, but they are legally binding on governments. And we don't see that the text until after it's signed. Parliament doesn't see it and the public doesn't see it until after it's a done deal, uh, which is a decision made by Cabinet, not Parliament. There is a Parliamentary Treaties Committee review, um, but the committee can't change the text, um, can't change what's been agreed. And there's no independent studies done of the economic or social or environmental or health or other impacts of these agreements. And Parliament only gets to vote on the, a very narrow range of implementing legislation, usually tariff rates, and that's it. They don't let, um, vote on the rest of the content of the trade agreement, although these trade agreements now have up to 30 chapters dealing with a wide range of issues. So it's designed, they are designed to lock in future governments and reduce democratic space. Now, what happened during the pandemic is that the pandemic really dramatised the flaws of um, this um, arrangement and this sort of neoliberal ultra free trade approach um, because it showed us that we were too dependent on, on imports and especially um, short, you know, we had shortages of, of everything, but especially medical products and vaccines. Um, it showed us that the temporary worker arrangements that are often made in trade agreements where you have workers who are tied to one employer and can be deported if they lose their job, 
they weren't entitled to any support from government during the pandemic. Um, it, it showed um, how uh, there, were, there was restricted, potentially restricted regulation of essential services, and this came up around the debate about the Aged Care Royal Commission when it emerged that it wasn't clear that aged care had been exempted from the rules of trade agreement which say that you should essentially freeze regulation of um, services like aged care that are privately um, run but publicly funded. You should freeze that regulation and not increase it in future. Of course, that would stand in the way of <coughs> implementing things like better staffing levels, better quality standards and so on. And um, despite the mantra of free trade, which is supposed to be about competition and lower prices, um, it was very clear during the pandemic, and it's still clear now, that trade rules that entrench monopolies on medicines for 20 years got in the way of access, equitable global access to medicines. Um, so um, that meant that um, the half a dozen companies that had a monopoly on medicines globally got to decide how much and what price medicines, uh, vaccines and other COVID medicines were distributed. And of course, we still have less than 20% of people in low income countries being vaccinated. And that's a trade rule in the World Trade Organization and in our free trade agreements. And we've been campaigning to, to get a waiver on that related to the pandemic, but I won't go into that now. Um, and of course, we've also had the additional legal rights for corporations to sue governments over changes in regulation um, called Investor State Dispute Settlement or ISDS. This is the rule that allowed the Philip Morris Tobacco Company to sue the Australian government over our planned packaging law. And um, during the pandemic, there have been threats from corporations where there are trade agreements with this provision that they will use this to sue the government uh, for claimed compensation over um, they, what they see as restrictions on their activities during the pandemic. Um, but this neoliberal trade policy has been contested by community groups and also increasingly by the academic evidence. So all of the organisations that are in our network unions, public health, environment, churches, etc., um, have contested the secretive process, the dominance of, labor cor of global corporate interests and the impacts on workers. Um, so we had debates about the US FTA, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the China FTA. And there is grow growing academic evidence of broader neoliberal economic policy impact on global and, and lo local inequality. So studies by Stiglitz, Piketty and others. Um, and of course the pandemic exposed the flaws that I've already talked about. So the actual debate has really um, got a lot stronger about these and that debate and unions and others have influenced labour policy. So we do have a much better platform on trade policies from the Labor Party um, and, and we, what we're trying to do now is get them to implement those policies in government. So the first one is a more transparent process. Um, they've said they will have um, things like public statements to Parliament of objectives before negotiations start, release of text during negotiations, um, release of the final text before signing, and independent assessment of economic and social costs and benefits. And they've also said that Parliament should debate the whole agreement, not just the enabling or implementing legislation. Um, they've also said in their policy that there will be some red lines, that some things will be excluded from trade agreements. Um, so. Um, restrictions on local industry policy support, and they've said that they'll be more willing to use government purchasing of local goods and services to encourage local industries um, like renewable energy and other local industries. Um, they've said they won't um, increase medicine monopolies through trade agreements, and they have actually supported 
um, a waiver on the current WTO rules and other trade rules about medicine monopolies for the duration of the pandemic. Um, they've said that they won't support um, corporate rights to sue governments, ISDS. Um, the example that I gave before, Philip Morris Tobacco Company suing the Australian government. They won't support having those sorts of provisions in trade deals. And um, they've also said they won't support increases in temporary workers who are vulnerable to being deported if they lose their jobs. Um, and um, also they won't support removal of labour market testing to demonstrate genuine temporary labour shortages. So if there is a genuine te temporary labour shortage, that will have to be demonstrated by labour market testing, not removing labour market testing as a lot of trade agreements do. Um, and they've also, I think, um, certainly from our point of view, um, in a very hopeful sense, said that they will include in trade agreements um, legally enforceable labour rights based on ILO conventions and legally enforceable environmental standards. Um, and there is even a clause in the policy that says they'll ban the products of forced labour. Um, so um, that would go some way to redressing um, the downward pressure on um, labour rights and environmental standards by making sure that there's a floor under which in trade rules um, that mitigates against um, that, those downward pressures. Um, so, but there are some catches in this process and one of them is that the policy did say that in opposition, Labor was not obliged to block trade deals uh, that had these red lines in them, um, but once it gets into government, it will actually implement those uh, red lines and other policies. Um, so that meant that Labor in opposition did vote for a number of trade agreements which had some of these red lines like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which changed its name to the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, the, and free trade agreements with China, Indonesia and Hong Kong, which all have um, the, um, both the corporate rights to sue governments, or ISDS, and increased numbers of vulnerable temporary workers. Um, so one of the questions we're putting to the government is, because just before the election, the government signed a deal with the UK and an interim deal with India, um, what we're asking them is, um, will they, um, support those deals even if they include some red lines and will they be willing to renegotiate those red lines. And the India agreement is an interim agreement. There's um, a schedule to, to negotiate a more comprehensive agreement with India and again we're saying that they should implement their um, new consultative process for that agreement and for the EU trade agreement which is also still under negotiation and any future agreements. In other words, they should implement the policy for a, a more uh, transparent and inclusive policy. Um, so, um, it's interesting that with the EU, for example, they're good on saying that they want to have environment and um, labour rights. Um, but because they have a very big pharmaceutical industry, they've actually asked for some longer medicine monopolies. So we'll be certainly saying to the government they shouldn't agree to that because that's one of the red lines as well. Um, there's also the previous government had proposed a negotiation with the Gulf um, countries in the Middle East, which include um, Saudi Arabia and Qatar and a number of other countries which haven't even signed agreements on human rights um, and um, labour rights, you know, through the UN or the ILO, and they have very notorious um, violations of human rights and labour rights. Um, Saudi Arabia, for instance, recently executed 80 people. 
um, a mass execution. Uh, and of course they have a bonded labour system as well. So what are the chances that labour will do this? Well, we'll there'll certainly be pressure on them from the labour movement and from other civil society groups to implement the policy. Um, but some of the, the pressures that we'll face is um, the context that they're operating in, that there's a growing strategic competition between the US and China. Um, and this occurred after we negotiated, or the government negotiated, the Liberal National Government negotiated a, a um, free trade agreement with China. And it's worth saying that at the time, unions and civil society groups said to the government, China has a very bad labour and human rights record and we should be not um, negotiating a um, free trade agreement, which is essentially a preferential agreement with that country until they do something about that record. Uh, at the time, the government completely ignored us. Um, but now, because of increased strategic tensions, um, they're very more, much more prepared to um, admit that that's the case. Um, the, so trade deals are always influenced by geopolitics. So one of the issues is that, you know, the trade deals negotiated over here, it's meant to be about um, economic gains and lifting living standards, but it's always influenced by who our friends are and where the strategic competition is. Um, so the current trade deals with the United Kingdom and India are part of a strategic alliance, so they've got to be seen in the context of AUKUS, which is the US, UK, Australia defence arrangement and also the Quad, which is the US, Japan, India and Australia. So both of those agreements were kind of hurried up last year because of those defence and strategic agreements. So there'll be pressure to agree to those agreements for defence and strategic reasons. Um, and um, the danger is that things that... Um, red lines will be, will be ignored because of that pressure. The other pressure we face is um, corporate lobbying and advice from, especially corporate lobbying that want to have provisions and trade agreements that suit them, not necessarily um, that will lift living standards and be good for everyone. And also um, the, um, especially the senior levels of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, which um, have very much, operate very much in a neoliberal um, type um, framework. So um, basically what we have to do to support trade justice is campaign, I think, for Labor to implement its progressive trade policies. Um, and this means demanding more transparent and accountable trade agreement process, supporting local industry development policies and local procurement policies, making sure they're not fettered by trade agreements, supporting fully enforceable labour rights and environmental standards, including carbon emission targets, and opposing in things like increased medicine monopolies or increased special rights for corporations to sue governments. Um, and also um, opposing things like um, the removal of labour market testing and increased vulnerable temporary workers or restrictions on government procurement. So we're back to um, education, organise, mobilise. Um, but I think we're doing that within a much better framework than with the previous government. We have got a government that says they will, this is their policy. We've got to just make sure that they actually implement the policy. Um, and I'll just, there's some information there about our network. We're a network of 60 community organisations. Um, as Peter said, we had our 20th anniversary during the pandemic. Um, we have current campaigns on equitable access to COVID vaccines and treatments, more transparent process, and on those current agreements with India and the UK and the EU. And there's some, um, you can go to our website to donate or join or support us. We've got a Facebook page and we've also got some tea towels um, for our anniversary which have Tamburg cartoons. Um, this one, my, this, is, this one is about the, um, 
Philip Morris case against the um, plain packaging legislation. And this one is um, actually um, about the secrecy of trade agreements and the debate that took place when we, uh, when the TPP was going through Parliament where the government said that anyone who questioned it or wanted more information was just against, you know, progress in trade. Um, so if you'd like a tea towel, they'll be, um, they're $10 each if you want to um, buy one and we've got a credit card facility if you're interested. Um, so thanks, I'll leave it there. So I'll kick off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we all meet today and pay my respects to our elders, leaders, past and present. I also want to thank Peter uh, for the invitation um, to come along and speak today. He's always thinking of me when he puts on these events and I, I try to make time to, to get here when I can and uh, to be honest I missed a few up uh, because I put them in my diary on the wrong day so I owe Peter um, um, a few uh, back and I said to him anytime you need me I will be here. Um, secondly, um, thank you to Pat. It's always a pleasure to share a stage with Pat and I've been working alongside her for a number of years now just making sure that trade stays on the agenda uh, across the Labor movement, but importantly in that conversation inside Labor and, and that it's taken seriously. Uh, for those who haven't met me, I'm Steve Murphy, I'm the National Secretary of the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union. I've been a member now since I was a second year apprentice, uh, 26 years as a member, and I've been working for the union for 19 years. Um, I, I was State Secretary in 2017 and National Secretary in 2019. Late 2019, so almost two years in, uh, almost three, two years, two years in the job, of course. Um, so, I'm, like many people in this room, I'm, I'm relieved at the results of the federal election. We've watched uh, for years with, uh, with dismay the, the lack of culture and ambition of the previous government uh, in terms of most of progressive politics and the agenda that we needed to happen. And it's great to bear witness now to a country that is undergoing significant change, but change that is being led with a level of compassion. Uh, and we're already seeing some of that at, a, at an international level where we've seen a lot of those relationships with Albo overseas and others overseas kind of repairing and resetting, not just those relationships, but our standing as a country at a, at a global level. Um, and you know, while foreign affairs might not be one of those exciting issues for the general public, uh, we've watched the previous government with a level of collective embarrassment, I guess would say, where they've trashed our reputation internationally and, and trashed the Australian brand. And the last nine years have been a pretty appalling one in terms of our approach to trade as well. Um, we've spent, of course, 30 years striding the neoliberal agenda, simply opening up our borders, uh, not protecting workers or our industry or even our national identity or our self-sufficiency. Self -sufficiency. And we've got a government from both sides that in succession that have been acting simply as the profit enhancers for private capital. Uh, changing the rules so that they can move their investments and their profits um, to avoid their obligations and to avoid um, scrutiny. Now, if you've ever spoken to me in the past um, about free trade agreements, I usually talk for a long time, but it will mostly be focused about the decimation of regional jobs all across Australia. But we're filled into believing that if we sign up to this free trade agenda, um, that we'd all be driving around in Mercedes Benz and that we'd all, all be kind of lifted up um, the ladder uh, with the promises that we made. But the truth is we traded away tens of thousands of good, reliable, well-paid union jobs that regional Australia could rely on, that kids could rely on, a job coming through uh, so that we could buy a fridge for $70 cheaper. Uh, and you have to say, if you look back over that time, you'd say that is not a fair trade. Now, during those trouble global trade negotiations, we have largely been a, a junior partner and we have always been out negotiating. Um, the reason that these things are always negotiated in secret is so that we never see the details and we never get to see the level of incompetence that happens at that level when these negotiations are taking place. But what we do know from the outcomes of these free, agreement, free trade agreements time and time again, there's always workers who pay the price for uh, Australia being out negotiated or out maneuvered. In, in relation to the results. Now just because you, you criticise the way that trade agreements uh, happen or the way that trade is done in a way that benefits corporation only does not mean that you, you criticise trade altogether. We've had no mature debate in this country about our trade agenda and where it should sit. Uh, 
whenever you start the discussion about where, what trade should be used for and its purpose, it's always shut down by sycophants from both sides of politics. Uh, and you're labelled again about you're labelled as being against the national interest if you want to reframe or talk about trade in a way that benefits working class people at the centre. Now our campaign that was led by the AMW but certainly supported across the broader trade union movement was about improving Labor's platform, but mostly about changing the mindset inside Labor and those decision makers uh, in over two conferences, and it took us two goes to get it to where we needed. The, and, and both of those conferences were a turning point for the opportunity for significant change in relation to trade. The first one was a change that was based uh, on us picking a fight with, with Labor at the right time in order to get them to take trade, trade and the trade agenda seriously. And the second one was to reshape the trade agenda with a whole host of policy and platform changes behind it that would allow us to be able to negotiate in a different way and I'll go through those uh, in a moment. But I think what we all agree is that we should have a trade agenda that is smart, that is compassionate, that is ambitious, but mostly that is fair. Uh, and it's not, and, and it's about Australia not just being a quarry and a farm and, and a nice place to visit. So we've got all the tools and the resources for us to be a manufacturing and an energy superpower. Um, it, it's um, something that we have been advocating for a long period of time, and our vision has got to be that we produce more than what we consume. That's where we participate in trade, to be able to um, identify those areas where we produce more than what we're consuming and be able to trade with the world on those. So we've got a whole host of commitments and we were able to change the platform, as I said, but now it's about legislation and enforcement. That, that is the job that Labor has in front of it to do and, and those people who, who, who have um, kind of benefited from the campaign that we ran during the election that have now got a seat uh, of power and privilege um, and position and now got a responsibility to us to make sure that they go forward and legislate uh, and enforce the, that platform agenda. And I wanted to talk about it in two key areas. The first one is linking our trade agenda to, to some key platform and policy issues uh, and, and, and the portfolios that sit underneath those. And secondly, about less concentration on ministerial, ministerial power. Uh, so obviously an indicator of trade justice is that uh, we're able to interlink with other areas where Labor has a big ambition. Uh, and their policy, I'll just read out the policy um, wording, but what it says is that Labor will develop industry policy and provide structural assistance to sectors of the economy, workers and regions which are impacted by economic change. Um, now, we shouldn't read the platform as being separate sentences that are in isolation. The platform should be read as a document that is about lifting each part of the platform up. Now, we've got an, a positive manufacturing and agenda policy that Labor has announced all during the election campaigns on the platform, but they made manufacturing and, and, and energy central to all of their policy announcements when they were on front of the TV cameras and talking to working class voters. And that offers us a strategic and significant economic uh, strength. If we are able, if we are able, not if we are able, but when we are able to get collaboration between not just trade and primary industries, but if we're able to get collaboration between trade and industry and energy and primary industry and the resources uh, ministries and portfolios, we have a path and a significant path to unlocking trade justice and transformation uh, of Australia's uh, manufacturing and trade agenda. Now, large corporations. Uh, who own these farms and these quarries have a very short-sighted and uh, narrow-sighted uh, view about how trade is operated. That is to cash in as early as possible uh, and make their profit as early as what they possibly can uh, during um, the manufacturing cycle. And we need some serious dialogue about how we add value at each step in that change. In, in that in that chain, um, one is to secure cheap power. Secondly, is to have a vibrant high skill manufacturing industry and thirdly is to rebuild us, our self-reliance and our self-sufficiency as a nation. Now that collaborative approach between ministers and assistant ministers uh, and departments is going to be one of the first litmus tests that we uh, have to take during this uh, first three years of the Labor government. Uh, and, and that is a test to see whether or not that trade justice is, is actually centre of Labor's agenda for this first term. 
Now, the ALP are saying that they are reformers, that they've got a reform agenda, that they're going to make significant change and they're committed to the platform. But we've got to keep doing work outside the parliament to, to lead that ambition and make sure that Labor does not lose its courage during this. The second one I was going to talk about was um, the other measure um, being democratisation. Now, um, they have committed in the platform to having a Labor Advisory Committee on Trade uh, and secondly, legislating that there's going to be transparency. And there's a couple of measures that you do in terms of uh, transparency on the way through, but transparency after the agreement is made. And that means that we've got less concentration of ministerial power. We will have a set minimum uh, level of standards that need to be adhered to when we do these trade agreements. And thirdly, that there's going to be an independent assessment on how well we went during the negotiations and what the economic benefit is to Australia. And all those things have got to be done before the agreement is signed. And you can see from that that the labour movement, civil society and that small business have got an opportunity uh, to jump in, to scrutinise, but mostly to participate in what our trade agenda is going to be at a national level and to reshape that in a way where we all benefit. Um, it reshapes um, how negotiations happen and it will make it harder to undo the changes that we're able to make which are positive. One of the other things it will also do is that it will make it harder for other governments, meaning governments of other countries, to be able to sit, par sit by and just wait for there to be an electoral cycle and hopefully a change of government back, back the other way, and they'll be forced to build relationships um, that are based upon fairness and based upon trust. Now, our opportunity um, for influence uh, at a world stage, meaning Australia's opportunity for influence, is only is only um, as big as what we allow ourselves to make it. And that means that we need to have a minister and assistant minister that have a big agenda, a big vision, and um, have got a department, and a number of departments, sorry, that are prepared to back that in and make it live. live. And I'm told that uh, Labor is going to make this a priority, um, that they are going to craft the words of this with the intention that it's going to make it hard for future governments to undo um, uh, this uh, democratisation of um, the trade agenda and negotiations. Now both of those changes um, by themselves might seem as though they are insignificant and not um, something that is going to be a great big splash, um, but we have to get those ingredients right in order to reshape trade and make those first few steps um, to show that Australia is going to be a leader when it comes to it. But the truth is that fair trade is, is in need of a, a desperate makeup. It, to many, uh, trade is an issue that is very, far too complex and, it, and it's too hard to unravel. Uh, and we need to reframe trade to be um, a, a lever to progress our national nation's ambitions, but secondly, that it is a lever to deliver justice to working class people all around the world. Um, now, our labour movement has also got to have some serious conversations internally, but a conversation with people all across the country. And that is, we've got to bring people with us and reframe this in a way that empowers people to participate and empowers them to make an impact when it comes to this trade agenda that we've got to roll out. And we've waited nine long years for this moment, this moment that changed the government and to have a bigger conversation about what our trade agenda is going to be. And there's a hunger that sits behind Labor's victory, but a hunger that sits behind the promises that, that have been made. Uh, it is going to be our discipline that will hold Labor to those promises, and secondly, hold Labor to not trade off when business and those opponents throw everything they have to keep things the same, um, to continue on their cycle of defending their profits um, at, at, at any cost. But we come up all this together uh, in a way that has got integrity, that has got purpose and has compassion, and ensure that future generations look to now as a time to learn about the way that you engage uh, at that level to deliver change that is lasting and then will deliver change for working class people around the world. So that, that's what I wanted to cover, Pat and Peter. Um, that, that covers what you asked. Yeah. And uh, normally I try not to ask too many questions, but from what you've talked about, sorry, let's go back one step. Commercial agreements, there are very, very good justifications for being commercial agreements, secrets, and secret to some extent. But to what extent are political parties motivated, like previous governments 
Thanks very much, uh, Pat and Steve, for excellent presentations. I found that very informative. But also, the, the spirit is good. I mean, the old adage, change the government and you change the country. Well, maybe. There's, there's potential here, isn't there? For a really movement of a sort we haven't seen for a decade or more. Uh, but uh, as you both emphasised, it's really up to the labour movement and progressive organisations to make sure that things that are agreed in principle get implemented in practice and I'm sure we're all very conscious of the fact that it's not just a matter of the labour movement and organisations like acting and bringing pressure to bear, it's also a matter of anticipating the other forces at work, I'm thinking the interests of capital uh, in particular, I mean we're, we're not going to see corporate interests just uh, shut up shop because uh, we've got an Albert Easy government rather than the usual uh, conservative coalition model. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to hear a bit more about what you think is going to be happening on the other side, which I don't mean the, the coalition politicians, I mean they're out of picture, but with the corporate interests and how they're going to play the current situation from, from here. And in particular, what will happen if Labour is forced around those red lines that you were referring to, Pat, to perhaps back off from crossing them, which then violates the very principles that you are advocating. What, for example, if Labour says, oh, uh, under pressure from corporate interest, we're not going to implement a particular industry policy, a particular procurement policy, and then we're back pretty much to square one, are we not? So, um yeah, I did allude to this at the end, and um, there's no doubt that, um, I mean, Steve will talk more about industry policy. I think that there is some degree of certain parts of investors and capital that actually want to have local manufacturing and renewable industry, energy, renewable energy industries and so on, that, that the unions and others can work with. In the trade, arena, what we're facing is um, international capital, particularly those parts of capital that are, that are invested in the old fossil fuel industries um, and um, others which see their main interests as protecting this global um, production chain um, arrangement which is which suits them. In other words, they want to have the maximum 
uh, flexibility to move their investments wherever they want to trade whatever products they want and they don't want to be hindered by um, uh, local industry policy or even the obligations to um, treat workers decently or have um, higher environmental standards and they use trade agreements to have weapons like um, rights to sue governments if they change their policies um, as we saw with the tobacco case and of course there those sorts where there's trade agreements with those provisions fossil fuel companies are now using them to sue for instance the Canadian uh, government's being sued because the province of Alberta is phasing out um, uh, coal and, and other fossil fuels for energy uh, production so um, but they are very powerful forces. Um, however, I do think we've got, um, you know, in terms of mobilising against them, there is a very strong desire on the part of people in Australia to have, for instance, uh, a, um, you know, proper strong targets to reduce emissions and to have local industry policies which can do that. Um, the other thing I, I do think that I alluded to and I think is a bit of an obstacle too is this idea that trade gets subsumed into strategic competition between the US and China in particular and that Australia just kind of goes along in the wake of the US policy. I think there is a bit more possibility with a new government to have somewhat more independence in some of those areas but um, they're under enormous pressure and um, before the election they indicated that they um, of course by agreeing to AUKUS and so on that they're very much in that um, framework so um, making sure that they stick to their trade policy and not get subsumed by that um, is going to be another challenge. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to add that, you know, I think that large corporations, when they get a sense of what Labor's agenda is going to be uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, manufacturing and, and trade, uh, are going to push back. Um, you know, you have a look at the way that uh, the mining industry responded uh, when, they, when Labor was proposing a, a super profits tax, um, where they were prepared to spend. Um, a, a huge amount of money to defend uh, what is uh, what they see as their um, unilateral right to generate as much profit as what's, what's possible can. And the only thing that's less measurable than their profits is their level of greed. So I think what we will um, no doubt see um, when Labor starts to reframe the debate about these things is a, a big push from corporates and um, their, their kind of lobbyists that go into the parliament to influence political decisions. Um, secondly, I, I just wanted to kind of um, touch on uh, how serious I think this agenda that has been committed by Labor is. When, when I say serious, how, how serious um, Labor is committed to, to the agenda. Uh, so we did a whole host of work in the lead up to the federal election uh, by the AMW uh, through our support of the campaign uh, and we were successful in getting um, Anthony Albanese and the Cabinet to endorse uh, our pledge uh, and that our pledge has three parts to it. The first one is to rebuild Australian manufacturing with good union jobs and to do that in three ways. One is to bolt down what we currently have, to secure our supply chains at both ends, so the feed in and the feed out to add value and the third one is to identify those industries where uh, they are newer and emerging and that Australia should try and get a foothold in there and be a world leader and hopefully uh, a, a world exporter. The second uh, area that they committed to was a big agenda on skills uh, and skills for workers. So skills that we need right now, skills that we need for the future and the third part being a huge opportunity for young people to get an apprenticeship into a trade and to change their lives. And the third agenda that they committed to as part of support Aussie made was to have workplace laws that um, create fairness and power for working people in their workplaces. And what we've said is that all three of those are inseparable, they all work together, without one you can't um, benefit in the other two. 
and, and they have signed that pledge and um, are committed to delivering it in government. Uh, and we'll see a whole host of work that is being done around industry policy, policy that's going to support that. The two things you need to make that a reality are money and political will. Well, Labor has committed $15.2 billion to rebuild um, and we'll reconstruct Australian manufacturing, so we've got the money. Secondly, we've got two really committed ministers in it, Ed Husey and Tim Ayers, uh, who I've met with both and um, are absolutely determined to make sure that that manufacturing agenda is front and centre. An idea, um, or an example, I guess, would be the better way to think about this, is that we are about to move into being a huge miner for lithium, uh, being that that's going to be made into batteries in the future and will power the world's energy needs. We've got one of the biggest re um, kind of reserves of, of, of lithium in the world. The agenda is going to be, hopefully, that we don't just get that lithium out, put it on a boat, send it overseas and buy back the finished product, but we refine it, we manufacture it into batteries, um, we um, become self we, we provide ourselves with the batteries that we need for our own energy needs in order to, to get us to the point where we've got the cheapest energy, renewable energy in the world. But we also export those batteries under the guise that when they reach the end of their life that we bring it back, that we recycle it and we make new batteries out of those old batteries. And that's the kind of visionary industry policy uh, that Australia had under the button car plan that I think that we will see under a Hughes and Gineas uh, industry policy plan. Okay. And that sounds good. Okay. Andy. Thanks, Peter, and, and, and congratulations to the two of you. It was terrific, very inspirational. Should be full here. Um, mm -hmm. Thinking about this stuff is so important. And uh, positive feedback is very encouraging. Pat and I have got a connection with Adelaide. Uh, we have a woman in Adelaide, Jud Judith Sloan, who is quite conservative. Uh, and I remember early stages when I was promoting some idea along your lines of fair trade and caring about human rights when you're dealing with trade, particularly with our East Asian neighbours. Um, and she wrote this piece saying, well, it's nothing to do with the negotiations, this is economic matters. You exclude questions of principle and morality and concern about fairness and justice because that's an economic agenda. I just want to ask both of you whether or not you get a feeling, thinking also about um, Trump versus Hillary, where Hillary was supporting the TPP and then subsequently changed because the Trump position was opposed to it. So whether or not there's a general feeling of the globalisation, liberalisation agenda that's shifted a bit, more opening to the notion of the downsides of it, whether or not then that goes to the question of the attitude of the bureaucrats implementing policies of both the admirable presentations you've made, whether or not this is actually shifting a bit within the bureaucracy. I mean, we've got Pusey and his economic rationalist stuff, whether or not there's a shift within the system so that some of the ideas promoted by Labor are not suffering from the friction of these bureaucrats. I guess three parts, labour rights, immigration um, and, and, and fairness. Um, and I, I guess it's fair to say that um, you know, corporations and their lobbyists and their political mates always get a seat at the table. But you don't get any workers at the table, you don't get any unemployed people, any pensioners, you don't get um, marginalised people, you don't get people who have fallen behind or fallen through the cracks sitting at the table saying, we should get a voice in these things. And, that, and it could be no surprise that the, the big uh, benefit that comes from trade agreements is always to the people that are in the room. It's that old saying, if you, you don't have a seat at the table, you can guarantee that you're on the menu. Um, and I think that labour rights um, are one of the fundamental areas that when we come to free trade, that should be front and centre of those negotiations, but most importantly not for negotiation. That there should be uh, international labour organisation standards included in every free trade agreement as a starting point. And, and trade could have been a magnificent, magnificent thing. It could have lifted millions and millions of working class people out of poverty with um, you know, education and literacy rates and um, access to healthcare, access to pharmaceuticals, access to medicines. Uh, but it never is. It's always been about a race to the bottom 
and corporations stealing as much of the wealth to put in their own pockets as what they possibly can, and they steal it from all, all, all the rest of us. Um, so th there's going to continue to be that agenda while ever they are the only ones in the room. And uh, as, as I said in my, th in my presentation, is that Labor's platform is about democratising that and allowing other players to start to participate and to feel as though we're able to influence the outcomes of those, those kind of agendas. Second, the issue of immigration. This is one of the areas that you know, has always been polarised in Australia. We are proudly one of the most peaceful, multicultural nations in the world, and we, we all benefit from that. Um, we've, but we've had immigration reframed with you know, labels like uh, um, boat people, for instance, that almost dehumanise people that are trying to uh, escape to a better life because of the way that they're treated in their own country. And we've had uh, workers who come legitimately to Australia for work uh, and for a quality of life really being not reframed or, or a light shone on them as if they are here to reduce our living standards because they are um, exploited by, cap by capital. Uh, and I ha had some initial conversations with the industry minister that says that we should have a skills migration program in Australia and they should, be temp not, should not be temporary work visas, they should be permanent migration uh, uh, in those areas. Uh, so we're working through a, a process to identify what are the skills areas where we need um, bring people in, but that doesn't mean that that is our only immigration source. We need, we need to bring uh, people to safety um, as part of our immigration uh, standard. And the third one, I think, is, is about um, fairness in our region, and that is that we can reframe debate that rather than chasing the cheapest possible cost for whatever it is that we want to consume, is to start to put a price on the value of labour in our region and to lift working class people, no matter which country we trade in, to lift them up out of poverty and to be able to have a decent quality of, of life. And I remember reading a, a quote, I can't remember who said it, but you know, we, we, should, we, should, um, we, we should pity the person that wants to buy a coat that is made by someone else who has to live in poverty or die manufacturing. Yes, I, I might just add to the bit about the shift um, or more more criticism of neoliberalism and where, whether it's penetrating the bureaucracy or not. I do think that since the global financial crisis, there has been a lot more holes punched in um, the um, very um, threadbare neoliberal economic theory, um, which just leaves everything to market forces. And um, it's really, um, that there are a lot more, um, well, there's a whole political economy department which um, Frank's been involved with, but other heterodox um, views now being debated about, um, you know, what is the approach to economics generally, including trade. And I do think that in particular the pandemic has punched a lot more, the experience of the pandemic has punched a lot more holes in neoliberal trade theory because it has become obvious that you must have local manufacturing capacity to be able to deal with things like pandemics. I mean, we didn't have enough face masks, we didn't have enough ventilators, we didn't have enough capacity to produce vaccines. And that, that happened everywhere. So I do think that um, in that, at that level of theoretical debate, <clears throat> there is a lot more discussion now than there has been in the past. And in terms of whether that's penetrating the bureaucracy, um, I think Labor is appointing some new people at senior levels, I hope they are, um, and advisors who can give them this advice, and I hope that they'll have the um, political stamina to stand up to the sort of yes minister type advice that they might get from some of the um, senior bureaucrats who are, um, you know, steeped in the neoliberal traditions. Um, and I do think there's more ammunition, more actual evidence um, that they can use now than they, you know, that's developed particularly since the global financial crisis and especially since the pandemic. Hand that. It's clear that after so many years of the bad Liberal government, 
that Labor getting into government is going to change a number of things. There are a number of reforms on the table. That's pretty clear. Um, but we know that they are also, as government, um, running a capitalist country, that or economy, that they will come under enormous pressure by what Steve said, by the people who are at the table, which are not the workers and not the ordinary people. So one would expect that we would need a lot of pressure put on the Labor government to keep it moving in a progressive direction, rather than succumbing to that, no, well, I'll say to us, oh, we couldn't do anything about it there, this is the way it is, or whatever. So we know that it's only people out in the streets or, you know, taking actively engaged in the issues that will actually keep that pressure up. But traditionally, under a Labor government, the workers are more passive tend to be more passive because they believe, or because they hope, or they believe you that... Mistakenly believe. Whatever. <laughs> Definitely mistakenly. Believe that Labor's going to do it for them. And to some extent what I'm hearing here is that, yes, the bureaucrats might do this, or the, you know, the Labor government, in, you know, and so on, will, will do these things. So I'm just... I mean, I like the ending of, of Pat's thing, you know, we're going to educate, mobilise, organise. Is that going to happen under this Labor government, I suppose, is my question. How do we combat the passivity of workers under a Labor government? Are the unions going to step up their leadership and actually fight for I mean, you know, okay, Labor gets in and they stop the funding for the ABCC, and so that's really good, but are they going to fight for the right to entry? Are they going to fight for the right to strike, which is no longer allowed in this country, except for very small periods? So I just wanted to ask that question. That's a really good question, um, and I guess the best way to kick this off is that you know I've done a lot of meetings with our members uh, over the last 18 months that we've been building our support Aussie May campaign, and one thing that rang true, no matter which audience I went to, is that uh, workers don't trust Labor. Uh, the, the, the feedback I got was that you know they'll make a whole host of promises to get themselves in, in the power, uh, and they'll deliver next to none of it. Um, so we built a campaign that was not um, designed or led by the union secretary, but designed and led by our members. We had 12 rank and filers that were off the job over the course of 18 months, um, mostly in their own spare time, building our campaign and running that on the ground, uh, into workplaces um, supported by me, of course, as the national secretary, and elevated wherever I could. And the whole idea about that is that it, it's a campaign that can't be switched off by the National Secretary because it belongs to our members and they're gonna, they've got an agenda now going post-election where it is about phase four holding Labor to account to deliver on our agenda. Um, and, and we said from the very start that the election day, if Labor changes government, that is not the victory for us. The victory for us is when we see change for our members at work, which means manufacturing jobs being created, skills being developed, and fairness restored at work. Um, on, the, on the union movement generally and, and participation, um, that, that is something that we've got to be very conscious of and I know myself that Sally McManus uh, is very conscious of what happened after your Right to Work campaign getting Kevin 07 in, uh, where uh, the union leadership for that period of time, their agenda was simply to change the government and get rid of John Howard and as soon as the election outcome was delivered they switched the campaign and all of its infrastructure off. Uh, and I, I know from my discussions with Sally, who is a magnificent leader of the, of the union movement, that there is no desire um, to, to be kind of, you know, lions under the Liberals and um, mice under Labor. Uh, that we are absolutely determined to make sure that Labor meets the ambition that our members hold for them to deliver. Uh, and, um, you know, re as recently as this, this week, um, talking with the ACTU is that, um, you know, inspiring working people is out of every day as union leaders. Uh, Labor has got a chance to teach, teach a whole generation of, of workers what it feels like to not be disappointed by the Labor Party. Um, <laughs> who have never experienced the Labor government in power, and this is their chance to teach them that Labor is on the side of workers indeed, it's not just on the, when it comes to words in the lead up to, a, to an election. So just in the last week, you would have noticed um, a number of things that have been happening where you can see um, that contrast of, of, the, of the trade union movement. We are continuing to push for a strong IR agenda, and you will have heard that you know, there's talk about defunding and the ABCC and the ROC. 
Um, we're going to see paid pandemic leave um, come into legislation very soon, and hopefully we will end those zombie work choices agreements and end the ability for employers to be able to unilaterally, unilaterally terminate enterprise agreements and cut workers' pay as a threat during bargaining. We'll see that happen really, really quickly. Uh, we're hopeful uh, if um, we can pull all this together to have a huge IR agenda in place and deliver um, as soon as practical that will restore um, not just working uh, decent rights for workers at work, but to restore that hope amongst working people that labour is serious when they say they're going to do something. So it's on the Labour Party now to demonstrate that that wasn't just words, it's about deeds. The other thing I was going to say is, you know, just this week we learned that Labour had, um, uh, whether that was uh, deliberate or it was inaction, has not extended paid pandemic leave. Um, uh, so on the 30th of June, paid pandemic leave for workers who have to isolate ended. Uh, and you would have seen myself, uh, Sally McManus, the nurses, the health and health service union, uh, the tra transport union coming out criticising Labor uh, for not having the decency during the middle of a pandemic because it's not over yet, um, uh, for them to extend that payment for workers who are genuinely going to struggle if they have to isolate. And it, and it will again become a choice for a worker to say, do I go to work and risk infecting the people I work with and, and the customers I have to deal with, or do I isolate uh, and um, starve my family? during that, and that's a choice that nobody should ever have to make during the pandemic. Oh, I'll make a correction. The, the thing they're going to um, legislate is paid family and domestic violence leave, not paid pandemic leave. I, know that I had the yeah. pandemic leave on my mind, but you know, the first time they ever paid family and domestic violence leave in our country. So, yeah, you'll see a lot of happening. A lot of stuff happening when Labor does the right thing, and the trade union movement responding when they're not doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. My name's Cindy Johnson. I'm here today because I think this is a really important issue. Uh, I haven't been out of the house for months. I've come out for this. <laughs> it's really important and it was a fantastic presentation. And um, I just think this is such an important issue. The same as privatisation is a huge issue in Australia. And it just upsets me all the time that these things are brought to the fore in the media um, over the last 10 years. Labor Party's been silent on those two subjects. And, you know, we never even hear Labor Party people talking about privatisation. And they keep off these subjects all the time. I want to know from you guys, especially you, Steve, because as far as I'm concerned, you're a talent, you're an asset to the Labor movement, right? Somebody like you should be on TV, right? The, the, the workers out there, like you say, they're hungry for information. Um, they're hungry for action. They don't know, they're sometimes they're ignorant, they can be persuaded one way or the other, right? People like you should be, you know, more visible. And like we, you know, the last few years, all we've seen, we've seen salad once a year or something, you know? Um, it's, it's really bad. And I was just, want, what I want to know is, what, how bad is it with your relationship with the media? Can you call a press conference on a certain subject like this and get, Get the media like chooks, you know, at the at the feed lot, you know. Can you can you can you attract the media? Can you be proactive in the media to get this kind of stuff up in the public eye? Because the other thing that's really important about this and privatisation is it unifies all everybody. It doesn't matter whether you're Aboriginal, it doesn't matter whether you're a Thai immigrant. It doesn't matter. It, it's, this is the sort of stuff, this is the bread and butter issues that the Labour Party can unify people under, you know, it's really important. So that's my question is just, you know, how are you going with media stuff? You know, who's your PR people? You know, how does it work? Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, that's an interesting question and thanks for coming out, Cindy. Um, the, I guess I was always taught when I was coming up as a trade unionist, um, probably like Doug Cameron used to say the most, is that, that the media is not our friend. Um, We've got to look at how we um, leverage free, free media um, to all um, working people's voices at the centre of it. Um, whenever I've done media, and you've always got to be mindful of this, and I think Sally does a magnificent job at a, at a national level on this stuff too, is that um, when, when you talk as a trade union leader, 
we should never talk like we are political insiders because the truth is that we're not. And I me mean, personally, I've, I've got zero interest in ever being a politician. I'm completely um, I'm, I'm at where I want to be, and that is representing workers. And, and what is authentic and different about the trade union leadership that we've got in the country right now at a national level across almost all of the unions is that uh, we are simply amplifying the voice and the concerns of workers. It's their stories that are more powerful um, than what our personal views might be. Um, uh, but it's also true to say that the quality of journalism in Australia at the moment is at an all-time low. And it's not just, the same as yeah. that today to. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, but that's not to say that there's not good people um, in, in journalism as well that do want uh, to get these stories out there. Um, you're right, it's, it's you know, um, we've all got an obligation to make sure that worker stories are shared, that they're out there and that we're, we're kind of bringing people with us on, on that story. The truth is that I generally avoid doing media and media unless I absolutely have to. Because uh, you always worry about, you know, what is the purpose and, you know, what, what are they going to use this for? Uh, I think media ownership laws in our country need a, um, some, uh, like there, there should be a Senate or an inquiry or a Royal Commission in the media ownership laws in this country to install fairness. There's a difference between reporting the news and reporting people's opinions, uh, and that should be, um, you know, very clear in relation to it. But I will take your views um, as well. My AMW members told me this as well. They want to see me out more in the media. Um, and we're hiring a new uh, communications media person who starts in two weeks' time. So hopefully you'll see a bit of a change. In well, the to that. <laughs> Can I just say that I think generally it's true that the media doesn't cover, cover unions and other community groups in the way they should. But I do think that during the pandemic, the trade union movement, by championing um, the wage subsidies, by championing the um, essential workers who kept working, um, have really made a difference. And a lot more people now, if you look at the reaction, the public reaction to the nurses, the teachers, even the railway workers who are going on strike, most people now know that these are the people who keep the country going. These are the people who worked all during the pandemic. And I do think there is a greater respect for workers um, and other workers respecting the work of different workers, which is very important. We need to build on that. The other thing I'd say is that I do think that the, um, a lot of unions and community organisations have been using social media and get into people, you know, like the mainstream media does now have a smaller role in a lot of people's lives in terms of being the source of news and especially for young people, they get their news from social media and I do think that a lot of unions and community groups are using social media to build up, um, you know, their own um, support and audiences and to spread that further out. Oh, look, just, just a quick concluding comment. I think this has been a really interesting discussion that you've had this evening. Uh, uh, my observation is that, you know, like you've just said, Pat, the, the pandemic has been a bit of a watershed. People uh, attitudes towards what they expect from government, what they, how they regard the, the labour movement, essential workers. It, has fundamentally shifted. And I think if we see trade policy in that context, there's good grounds to be quite optimistic. Because what you've talked about as an ideal trade policy has respect for all those broader social concerns, has respect for environmental concerns. Think of the tremendous environmental issues that are involved in uh, movement of goods around. If we just let capitalists decide on trade, according to their own sexual interests, those broader social and environmental concerns never get on the agenda. They're moving on that menu, they never get eaten <laughs> instead. Uh, uh, so I, I think if, if we can think of Labour being in office for more than one term of government, because there's not an area in which you get quick wins. I mean, the quick win outlook tends to favour the signing of trade agreements and let the devil in the detail. Uh, 
but the longer strategy is more like those accord years. Uh, didn't turn out well in all respects, but did involve a, a, a conscious program of planning transitions uh, to a, a, a future that does incorporate social uh, and environmental goals as well as more narrowly conceived goals of uh, economic viability and profitability. So I think if we can get Labour in office for more than one term of government and have that momentum from the uh, labour movement, societal organisations, there's tremendous opportunities that are facing us here in Australia right now. And indeed, some sections of capital will come on board because they're interested in local production for local consumption too, particularly in the, the new energy context. This, this is a marvellous opportunity and I'm delighted you emphasised that too in, in your talk, Steve. So thanks very much to both of you for triggering what I think is a, a great discussion on a really crucial event. Thank you.